We just need to have evening service all the time, don't we? Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that you chose to be here this evening. I know that this will be truly a, a sweet time in the Lord and, and uh, looking forward to it. Uh, how great thou art. I think that might be one of the songs we sing in heaven. What do you think? How great thou art. Anybody that does not have one of these commitment cards and would like one? Anybody like that this evening that would like one of those cards? Anybody? You all set? You guys good? So, what are you going to do with this card? Well, I do know that there is an opportunity for you to be committed to the work of God. I heard that was very important to be a faithful man last evening. And so, uh, just following up that, to say, okay, Lord, uh, what would you have me to do? Well, make a commitment. And a commitment is that you will give. Give your heart and all that you have to the work of the Lord and worship of the Lord. And, and Lord, I have talents that you've given me. They're yours. Lord God, I have a lot of time. Everybody's got 24. Everybody gets the same amount of time every day. Until God takes you home, you've got time. You also have treasure. For us in America, guess what? We have more treasure than about 90% of the world as an individual who in the poorest state in America. Now I know it's reciprocated with the cost of living here. I know it's really, really cheap to live here, right? Right? Taxes, buying a house now, side bottoms, buying a house, easy, right? What are they doing out there? We've got to take up a love offering for the side bottoms to get, to get that extra 10% on top of the $290 million they want for, the, for a 100 square foot house, you know. But yeah, this is what, you know, praise the Lord. Commitment to missions. Please, please consider, pray. We need to support these missionaries all throughout next year at the amount that we committed, and we need to add other missionaries. There's other works that need to be done, and we're going to do some more things to you in the beginning of the year in January about giving to missions and how God would allow us to go somewhere next year, maybe two or three, ten trips, Randy, we have to make up for this year, So, but at least one or two. So. God would allow us to continue to be invested in the world vision of God's heart to see people get saved. But also, too, we added something special this year, a special offering. You can give a one-time gift, and that's what we're asking for. In the month of October, a commitment to say, I will give to God's Christian missionary service. I will give to the work that is there that you heard about last night in Kafula Futa, where Bobby spent a great many years, and the Calloways have spent a great many years, and you're going to hear a little bit about that this evening. So, what do you do with it? You fill it out after you pray. But since you've already been praying about it, you fill it out, and you put it right in there. There's two of them in there. We're doing all right. We're getting there. We need about another hundred, okay? So... You can fill out that card. It's really simple. Make a commitment to missions and giving every month. Please consider God's work above your regular tithe and regular offering that you give to the Lord. This is above that. And that is the 1 Corinthians 16 offering to go to missions. And then that special one-time offering. Maybe it's $200, $500. Just make that commitment. And if it takes to the end of the year, but put that commitment in this October. The whole month, 31 days. Okay, and then we'll be able to say, Pastor Pule, we have committed so many thousands of dollars to the work of Kafula Food, to that hub station, and all that it's going to take to run that thing. One quick note before I have the Callaways come up. Five years ago, this week, I stood before you in an honored place, and I said, Lord God, please use this church to raise funds to buy a vehicle and maybe a little money for a container or two 
some, some, some plane flights or two. And this church, by the time we were done, 61704 dollars and five cents. I went and printed this all I got and going by my God. Then sings my soul. Woo. You know how much I love you and respect you and honor you. And this church shows that time and time again by their prayer for you, for their love for you, and by sacrificially giving. And uh, this church has given anywhere each month between three and four thousand dollars a month to support the Callaways. That's what we're supposed to do. To whom much is given, much is required, and that is committed much, shall be asked the more. That doesn't mean we slack off at the first of the year. We've got to continue to go and just pray what would be next for us, Lord. Well, this special offering is part of the next for us to be able to continue to be part of the work of God. Tammy and Brian, they have the evening. Of course, it is the Lord's evening. So without further ado, Brian and Tammy, come speak to us and come preach to us. and standing before um, several hundred women um, to be able to teach before them. Standing before my family is that much harder and um, very hard. And so I just recently found out that I was going to be sharing something. And um, I told Brian even today, I said, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> but... Um, when we, when we started, Brian, um, God gave Brian a verse for our family. And um, I'm just going to read it because I don't want to mess it up. It's Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And that is a verse that we've claimed this whole time. And God has provided this whole... Um, I, I say six years from the total at the beginning of the time that we went, or it started, and then we went. Um, you know, God, um, back whenever God, uh, Brian shared with me that we were going to go to Africa, I always knew or felt that we were going to go to Central America like Brian has shared. And so when he said that we were going to go to Africa, I wanted to go to Africa on a two-week short-term mission. <laughs> So, to go long term, that wasn't my idea. Um, but for Brian, it, it was, you know, it was kind of a shock actually when Brian shared with me that that's what God was calling us to do. And uh, I remember being at work um, with the ladies at my nursing job. And when I went to tell them that I was going to be leaving because I was going to go to Africa, and um, you know, they couldn't, you know, they didn't understand why I was going to Africa. And I said, you know, I was submitting to my husband because he was submitting to God's call on our lives to go. And, you know, people don't understand the word submission anymore. And they couldn't understand. They, they kept saying, I wouldn't submit to any man. And, uh, but I know what the word of God says. And I fear God enough to know that if, you know, if I'm not going to submit to him and to my husband, I fear that. And so 
um, time went on, and as one day I was driving, you know, because I still wasn't, you know, 100% about it. And one day I was driving home from work, and I was down um, uh, almost home, and uh, I was, you know, talking to God, and I was telling him, you know, Lord, I don't want to go to Africa. I wanted to go to Africa, you know, just to go for two weeks or so, and I don't want to move there. I don't want to give up my career that I've had for 30-some years. And um, I was at the top of my pay scale, and uh, plus our family was here. I mean, Titus is at home, but we have grandchildren and our daughters. And I remember talking to him and saying that, you know, but I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. And uh, it was like the next day or so, I was in at work, and I was at lunch, and there was a drug rep there. And uh, I was sitting at the table, and I was talking and sharing what we were going to do in Africa. And he overheard the conversation, and he asked, you know, what, you know, we were going to Africa for. And I said, well, we're moving there as missionaries. Well, everybody always thinks you're going to go build something. You know, you're always doing that kind of humanitarian type stuff. And I said, we're going to go share the word of God with the people of Zambia and whatever else God has in store for us. And, uh, you know, he said to me that, you know, he says, you know, I always wanted to go on the mission field. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, how come you didn't go? And he said to me, he said, because my wife didn't want to go. So she didn't want to go, so he never fulfilled what he felt he should do. And, um, you know, I just shared with him the reason why, you know, I was going to submit to God and, and go, because I feared the Lord. And uh, so, you know, we went on, and then um, we 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 left. And um, Proverb, when I first got there, you know, I was still, you know, kind of struggling, and God gave me um, a verse in Proverbs 20, 21, 13. And I'm reading, because that's in Proverbs for the day on the 21st, and so I was reading. And I came down to verse 13, and it says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. And so I was like, okay, Lord, you know, because, you know, we're in a place that there's a lot of poverty. And uh, so I didn't want to, you know, I was like, I took heed to that verse. I didn't want to stop my, you know, the, the cry of the people. And uh, so I posted that verse. I don't remember if you, the team remembers or not, but I have it posted on my refrigerator. It should still be there unless it's fallen off. But um, it posted on my refrigerator so I can look at that every day. And as a reminder that I didn't want to stop listening to the people. And uh, so the first thing I did when I got over there is I wanted to, outside of all the other little things, I wanted to learn how to drive because being at the mission, you know, we're out in the boonies and uh, I was not going to be stuck there. You know, if Brian was out doing things, I was determined I was going to drive. And it's crazy driving in there. And um, so I learned how to drive and uh, you know, did all that. Now, I went shopping. Lorna took me shopping, and she would take me into the cities. Now, we used to have to drive a half hour, an hour, you know, just to go to shopping. And uh, Lorna is a crazy driver. <laughs> she learned it from But she though. said, Bobby taught me. No, she said, Robert taught me <laughs> So how to drive. But she is a crazy driver. And going into um, the capital, Lusaka, oh man, that was, I, I didn't, I drove in that one time and I didn't like it. And she would just speed through there. But anyway, so she, she helped me with that. Now the first year, that's what she did. She took me shopping, she took me to the main cities and stuff, where to go for parts for vehicles and all that kind of stuff. And so um, that was the first year, just trying to get used to the culture and trying to get used to just the surroundings and everything, and uh, Lorna was, she was my go-to. And uh, then I came home that 2017, because Tanya was getting married, and I came home that year, and then we were up in Monmouth that year when we got the call that Lorna had passed away. And uh, so when we went back, we went back that, uh, I can't remember, but we went back, and then after a little bit, then I started doing the treasury of the organization GCMS. And uh, that was a huge job, a huge responsibility. And um, so it, it had a lot of um, 
ups and downs in that, but um, there was struggles with that. Um, not anything financial, but it's just with family, just working together with a family, trying to homeschool Titus and doing other things. And so um, I needed help in the house. And so I'd been praying about finding someone to be able to help, you know, to do little things because we wanted to help a family, but I wanted the right person. And uh, so we were praying about that. And uh, I talked to Brian about what he thought about Precious, which is Gift Kapika's wife. And, uh, you know, he said, yeah. So we prayed about it. Well, then we talked to her husband first because we didn't want to do anything to disrupt the family um, because Gift was already um, working with Brian as far as um, working with him and taking him around and, and being his interpreter. So we talked to Gift, and he said, you know, yes, they would. And so Precious came to start helping, and she helped three days a week. And she taught me a lot, and, um, and I missed that family. And uh, she named, she had two kids, they had two children, and then she got pregnant and then um, had their third and named their third one after Becky Bonner. And because uh, Becky and Bobby were there and, and ministered to them alongside with um, Gift and them. And then um, when we came back this time, um, we got, Brian got a text from them. And I thought whenever when we were home the last time before we left, I thought she had a little pooch. But, you know, you just don't say anything to, to women anymore. So I was like, and I said, finally, I said to her, I said, Precious, I said, are you pregnant? And she would laugh and say, no, you know, no. But sometimes, you know, they say, Yo, no, but mean yes, but... So anyway, I didn't, I just went on. I didn't think she, you know, was like, okay, she's not pregnant. So then we got a text from Gift saying that they had a baby. <laughs> and they named her Tammy, Abigail Tammy. And uh, so that, that's an honor. And um, so I miss them dearly. And um, they're the missionary, the family that went up to Syringi, and Brian's talked about that before. So some of the things that I've been able to be involved in uh, was the ministry with the ladies. Uh, Lorna had been doing that for a long time, and then I started uh, going in and teaching with that. And then as much as I could, I couldn't do it all the time because I was trying to homeschool Titus and be with him, but I was doing treasure, all that kind of stuff. And so anyway, I started doing the teaching. And then I had the ladies over one day. I had, you know, some of you ladies have brought me teacups because I wanted to, you know, do that and do something different, just to be able to minister to the ladies, love on the ladies. And so I had, there's probably about 15 of the ladies that was women ministry over to the house, and I had tables all set up, and I fixed spaghetti because I didn't want to do their, their normal, they're used to, they know spaghetti, they know what spaghetti is, and so I didn't want to do their normal meal. I wanted to do spaghetti, and I did salad, and Precious helped me that day, and dessert and all of that. So I did a big, big pot of spaghetti. Okay, so there's about 15 ladies. And so we're, we're serving the ladies. And they, their plates were just piled high. I mean piled high. And I'm like, oh my gosh, are they going to be able to eat that? Because <laughs> it was so much. But those ladies, I mean, no matter how long they stood there, they ate all of it. And then after that, they asked me where the Enshima was. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I didn't want to do the Enshima because you guys always have the Enshima. Tammy, next time you have Enshima, we're not full, we're not satisfied until we have the Enshima. I said, okay, next time. But, you know, there wasn't a next time with that. But um, anyway, so ladies, whoever sent the teacups, because we did have coffee in our teacups over there, and we had a good time. Um, one of the, one, the ministries that um, I helped with a lot was um, one of the guys' names was Bedford. He was, um, when, he, when we first came, he was a guy, he, he came out and he set it on the stoops. And when we would drive out through the gates, you know, we'd see what, you know, he needed. Well, he needed to talk to Doc, John. And so, but we were told that he was a drunk, and maybe he was in the past. I don't know. But anyway, so later on, he come to ask us, ask us if we, he, we could help. And we helped him with some things. But then he got sick, 
and he has cancer and um, different things going on with his kidneys and things. So, you know, I just, you know, I just loved on him and I helped him. So even to this day, well, until Crystal and them came back, we were helping him with the medications and things that he needed. And uh, he was so appreciative of the things that we were able to help him with. But, you know, these things we couldn't have done without you guys supporting us and taking care of us financially. And um, we took care of, helped take care of uh, Gift's mom. She was a widow. She lived right down the road. And uh, she was an older lady, I'd say probably in her 90s, late 80s, 90s. And she was a widow. And one of the things that Lorna did was take care of the widows, which she would take them things for Christmas time and do different things. So I wanted to help her with that too. And plus, Gift came to Brian whenever he went to Syringe and said to Brian to take care of my mom, you know, because she was going to be gone. And so we did for a little bit because then John came back and said that he wanted to do that because Lorna did that. And so, but she was a sweet little lady, you know, just walk barefooted down the road, you know, she'd have her hoe up on her back, you know, she'd be coming in from the field. She still worked in the field at 90, 80, late 80s, 90s. And she couldn't speak English, maybe just a panini, which is a little, very, very little. But we still had just, just exchanged smiles. And just I still talked to her, even though she couldn't understand things that I said if there wasn't an interpreter. I hugged her and loved on her. Um, another thing that we did ministry-wise is that the Lord laid on my heart was for the clinic, the Mashili Clinic that's been there for quite some time, was I had gone down to look at the clinic and tour, and one of the things is on their wall, they had this whole list of stuff, items, that women that are pregnant have to bring. You know, plus they had on there 50 kwacha for ambulance fee. And so I was asking about that. Well, what is this for? And they go, well, the moms have to bring. So they have to take everything. You know, here it's provided at the hospital. They have to literally take everything there. So one of the things that I wanted to do is I started buckets and doing buckets and then filling it with um, all kinds of things, the syringes, the, th the lances, all those things that they needed to, to have their baby. Because the moms that couldn't afford those, you know, I wanted, if they're, they're going to have their child forever, how long the Lord has them. So I wanted them to be able to ha go there and get taken care of, and then they can worry about the other things. And then we put a track and things in there. And the goal was is that we would go follow up um, with them to be able to share the gospel. Um, some of them even came from Quit Kitwe or Lasaka because their parents were here. Mom was here. Another thing that we did was girls, uh, daisies for girls, and that was the sanitary pads and the kits and things from a, a church here in the States did those, and then I would take them over in suitcases, or whoever would be coming would send them over in suitcases. And so Crystal and I had the opportunity to go to one of the schools in town in Lawancha, and uh, we asked, you know, the ladies, the young ladies that would be most in need, those, those are the ones that we wanted to share with. So Crystal shared the gospel, and we did that, and, and all of them raised their hands to come forward to, to be saved. So Crystal will continue um, doing that as long as she has the kids and things. And so that is one thing that's on my heart that I want to keep doing and help sending to her. Um, then we had um, a mother of twins that this was, they were born while we were here stateside. But um, Crystal and them had contacted us and the mom had died giving or shortly after birth of the twins. And so we helped provide the formula that they needed um, for the year. We just finished that up. I think it was right before they left to come back in September. So we provided those things and she gave blankets and things like that in the beginning. So those are things that you've helped with as well to be able to continue ministering to the people. And um, the... You know, one of the things that, um, you know, you guys are family. I didn't look at the clock to see how much time I had or taken. But, you know, you guys are family. And, and I don't know if you remember, but one of the last things I said here before I left, before we left to go to Zambia, was that I didn't want us to be forgotten. You know, because a lot of times you get to the field and... Um, 
you know, some missionaries or, you know, they may not, they may be prayed for and stuff, but, you know, they, they've sometimes, you know, have been forgotten. And I didn't want to be forgotten. But, you know, you guys didn't forget us. And uh, you guys have prayed for us faithfully. You know, we have never gone without. Not once. We've been able to minister to the people and share the gospel. And um, we've been able to do the ministry and, and carry that out because of you guys. And uh, we love you guys. Um, thank you for your investment in our lives. And, um, you know, when I came back, when we came back and, um, you know, I had my stroke in December. And um, I know now that I had at least probably one stroke that when I was over there in Zambia, um, just with the symptoms and stuff, but they subsided. And so when I went to the clinic there, you know, they told me, the one doctor that I seen said it was stress and uh, didn't tell me that it was a stroke or anything, but um, it was stress and anxiousness. And uh, I'm like, okay. And then... Um, then I went to see another doctor, and then they did a, she did an EKG, and then put me on medication there that just bottomed my heart rate down so much that it was like, you know, you get to like in the 30s, and where you just, you know, want to pass out. And so um, I adjusted my own medication because the, the whole pill was too much, but I didn't want to go off the half, into off of it, and to do the half. So anyway, God sustained that until we were able to get back home, and then you know, for, unfortunately, I had another stroke, two strokes um, in December. And um, praise God that all of the side effects that I had, you know, those have gone away. Um, but, you know, with the doctors still tell me, you know, that I can still have another stroke or more. And, uh, but I have a bigger God than that. And not saying that I won't ever, but I'm just saying that I have to trust in the Lord. He's always been faithful to me. And, um, you know, we've been able to do the ministry and give to the poor at God's leading without any, you know, disruptions. And um, so I just believe that, you know, when following, now I'm not saying that we haven't had our struggles and frustrations and things like that, because we have. It doesn't matter where you're at, you're going to have those frustrations and um, things that go on. But um, God has provided and he's taking care of us. And, uh, you know, Brian and I were talking today that, um, you know, we never had a flat tire. We never ran out of fuel driving because that was one thing that Lorna taught us. You never let it go below a fourth of a tank. And uh, so we never did. <laughs> Brian might have. I, I, try, I try not to. <laughs> But, um, you know, he has sustained us, and he's used, used you guys, and uh, you guys are a family. And, um, you know, I want to go back, and uh, it really bothers me that we, we're not. And I know that God's changing it, but, you know, I had plans. <laughs> Don't we usually have plans? And uh, I had plans because I still had... Um, I had more women's kits and things to, to give out. I had I, one of the churches here just had donated. The whole church had collected things for babies. And we filled up the barrels and just sent them. And they just came, like, in July, you know, there. And uh, to do mo more Moms for Buckets. And uh, I wasn't done. <laughs> you know, it was like, um, I wasn't done. And I still had, you know, the ladies' ministry that I was wanting to, to do things and change up. And, and uh, so please pray for me. I know that God has changed the direction. Um, also, still, I ha you know, all my kitchen stuff's there. You know, I took, if I took the container, the one thing I wanted was all of my kitchen stuff. If anything else didn't go, it was my kitchen stuff that I wanted. And um, so it's there. <laughs> So, anyway, I love you guys, we love you guys, and thank you for all your financial support, your prayers, and your love, and, um, so, that's it.
was, uh, you know, Bobby was down here saying, I had seven flats in one day. <laughs> we didn't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we were just talking about it. And, uh, you know, some of the things that other missionaries, like right now, if you guys know um, Sherry and uh, Hayes. Um, oh, my gosh, my mind just went blank. Joe. Joe uh, Hayden. Hayden. You know, Joe Hayden, if you guys have been keeping up with them from Decatur, they've only been in the country of Zambia for a year now. They got their car broken into, everything was stolen. Now they've just recently had their house broken into, everything was stolen. And just a few months ago, his wife was driving and hit a cow and rolled the car. And she was almost killed, really. I mean, she's okay, and she had to wear a neck brace. But, and, and the re Please pray for them, okay? But the reason I bring it up is because it's interesting how God takes people on a mission field and might be at the same place, but goes through different experiences. You listened to Bobby's testimony last night. I'm looking forward to You guys should sit down and get the whole scoop because it's just amazing. 17 bouts of malaria, right? 17? Never had one bout myself. You know, I don't know why. I, there's just as many mosquitoes there now as there was then. But you know what? God saw fit not to allow that to happen to us, and that's fine, you know. Um, but yes, uh, you know, the... God watched over us and he protected us while we were there and I'm so thankful for that and he just chose to do it in the way that he did and so I know it wasn't easy for my wife to get up here and share these things and um, hon I love you and thank you for uh, submitting to the Lord Amen. Yeah. you know I mean I wouldn't be able to do the things that I do I mean she I think I can say this all, all, all you wives make your husbands look so good you really do there's the things that she had to walk through over there. Wow, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't even share them with you, the things that God allowed my wife to walk through. But I know she's a stronger woman now. And I know that she's closer to her Lord because of it. And so with that, um, I'm just going to share a little bit from my side, what it was like when we went over there. When we got there, so a few things we did. Most of you all have seen um, on our, on, on, on what we've sent you on our newsletter is all the details and on Facebook of things we've done. So I won't go into a lot of detail, but what I want to share with you is how God is now bringing us back here. Okay. And so, um, when we left, uh, four years ago, and like Tammy said, it's more of a six year adventure from the time it really all started. Um, God really laid upon our heart a threefold plan. And I shared that with you. It was our threefold priority, and our priorities were um, to encourage and edify the already established works that were there, that Bobby had established, John and Kevin Petsky, Randy Foster, all these missionaries that had taken part. We were like the Paul the Apostle on the third, his third trip, just to go strengthen the brethren, right? But we also had uh, the obvious ones, evangelism and discipleship. That's very, very important. You want to see people come to know Christ, and then you want to perfect them, that they might grow up in the Lord, and that they too might even get called out and go plant some churches. Well, that was the third piece. The third piece was to establish pastor's training centers. And you know what? Praise the Lord. By the time we got there, boom, we got on the ground, October 13, 2016, and we hit the ground running. I remember my first Sunday there. I'm in a tie. I'm getting ready to preach, and I'm up on a ladder spraying to get rid of the bees out of my house. You know, and that's my first Sunday. They were just welcoming me. That was their way of welcoming us. You know, they came into our home and, and that was something that we dealt with all the time. It was no big deal. But from that point, we started going and traveling from district to district, church to church, sharing the gospel and, and just slowly getting our feet wet, slowly getting involved. And uh, shortly after that, as many of you know, the um, organization came and asked me to be the head missionary and the director of ministries. And through much prayer, we accepted that. I, I accepted that and moved forward with it. But again, I had no plans on doing that. That was not my plan. When I got there, John Sarah was a head missionary, and I was just planning on being a spoke on the wheel and moving forward. But as a man's heart directed his way, the Lord, or as a man's heart devises his way, the Lord directed his steps. And God had different plans. And so we ventured into this, and it, it, it was a huge responsibility. And m much more than just even one man could handle, honestly. And it, it was all about a team, having the right people, the right place, the right time, all working together. And John was, you know, John's health was diminishing. But he was, af he was at it. He was hard at it. Um, you know, he reminds me of an Elijah type of guy. Just, he's probably the toughest man I've ever met in my life. 
the toughest. I mean physical. Uh, I seen him out doing something, and a, and a, a metal splinter goes in his hand, and he just <laughs> spits on it and goes right back to work, you know? That's the type of guy he was. But yet, he loved Jesus. He knew the Word. He loved to teach God's Word, and he kept hard at it. So with that, we started working together just to continue to move forward. And, and as many of you all saw on a lot of our posts, you know, we eventually, even that first year, 2017, um, the first full year, we had uh, MCBC, a church up north, came in to do a, a teacher's training seminar. And then you all came the end of 2017. And we started having teams come in and just doing what Kafula Futa has always been doing, ministering to the people and investing the way we always have. But God started changing a few things. And um, one thing he allowed us to do was to take our discipleship lessons and have them um, um, translated into a few different languages. We started a discipleship program, or not really what program, but we went into each district and started teaching the philosophy, giving them the tools to be able to start discipling. And to this day, there are some churches that are still hard at it. There are some that aren't, and that's okay. But yet we started implementing this. At the end of 2017, God showed me that one thing about many of the churches that they were unhealthy. And so we started what we call the restoration ministry. And we went in and we started teaching them from Acts chapter 2 how they can look at their church, find out where they're at, and really start building them back up to a place of health. We started a restoration ministry. They had restoration pastors. And Pastor Alex Chippy is one of those pastors. And what we would do is we would pray about it and ask God to lead some of these men to a church that doesn't have a pastor and help restore them back to a place of health. We've got three or four pastors doing that right now. And it's a long-term ministry. It doesn't happen overnight. You're talking three years down the road. But it's something that God laid on our heart, and that's what we've been doing. Evangelism, discipleship, restoration ministry, and then just the everyday work that would take place over there. And in 2000. Um, in 18, I was driving with Pastor Elijah Pula, and he starts sharing with me that he's, he was young, he was in his 50s, he's getting ready to retire, and he said, you know what, Brian, I just really, I really feel like God wants in my life just to give 100% to him. I'm getting ready to retire after 30 years. I still got much time. I just don't know what God wants me to do. And I thought that was interesting because God started dealing in my heart because one thing I realized is exactly the same thing that Bobby said last night is that if Zambia is going to be reached, it's going to be reached by Zambians. You know, here's the thing. You and I, we can go in with the Word of God and we can teach people from different uh, uh, cultures and backgrounds Scripture. We can do that. That's great. But one thing, I don't care how long you're there, you'll never truly understand the depths of the culture and what they deal with. How many of you today had to deal with witchcraft in your life? That's something that <laughs> all of us, really, if you think about it, right? Amen? Rebellion? Is that what you're saying? Rebellion? But, but we see, that's something we don't have to deal with on a daily basis. We don't really see it. It's here. It's just masked differently, right? Over there, this is something that people deal with. I was at a funeral right before I came over, and I had the opportunity to preach at this funeral. Everything was interpreted in English except for one thing, and I don't know if it was done on purpose. But here's the thing, the man, uh, the woman who de deceased, Pastor McConta's wife, the man gets up and he starts thanking everybody in his own tongue about, you know, everybody coming and helping. But he also gave a warning. He said, if any of you had anything to do with the death of my, I think it was his sister, then you're going to have to answer for it. And he said more about that, but what he was talking was witchcraft. He was saying, if any of you had anything to do with bringing a hex or some juju on my sister, you know, you're going to pay for it. And see, here's the thing. We obviously know, well, I can't say it doesn't happen because it happens. But yet at the same time, here's the problem. A lot of the times they make the witch doctor this big, but they make God this big, you see. No matter how much you make God this big, they make the witch doctor, or they make God this big in the witch doctor. See, these are the things we're dealing with. And I can take you in scripture and help you with that, but I can't understand the depths and, of, of, of the stronghold that it has, okay? So, so God started laying these things on my heart, and he started showing me that Elijah Pooley was a man who'd been trained up under Bobby Bonner, and now God has grown him into a place. And I remember him telling me he had such a passion and a desire to reach the people of his country and to help the pastors who were in need.
because the pastors needed help from somebody who could understand them. They have a hard time coming to me because I can't understand them, especially after four years. And John being there for 20 plus, she being there for 18 plus, you know what? They would come to him, these men, because they were the founders of the mission. But yet even they, in so many ways, couldn't understand. So God started sharing to me. He said, Brian, you know, um, this is the man I want you to ask to be the director of ministries. And so this was my thought. Okay, and, and this is something right before I left, probably about two weeks before we came back in 2019, I sat Pastor Elijah Pooley down and I said, look, I really believe God is doing something in your life and he's doing something in the life of Kafula Futa. He's doing something in my life. Because see, what God has shown me, he's saying, Brian, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give the old ministry. And that's not a negative context. It's just the best way I can describe it. I want you to give that over to Pastor Elijah Pooley because he can understand. He can understand how to reach his own people. So when it comes to um, when it comes to pastor's training, when it comes to women's ministry, when it comes to the deaf and all this, to turn that over to him and let him be the director of ministries. And then what I was going to do was come back from furlough and I was going to focus on the youth and I was going to focus on pastor's training, what I felt God had called me there to do. See, when I got there, God redirected my heart. No longer, he, though he allowed me to do the first two priorities, but the third priority of pastor's training, he put that on hold. He said, Brian, not now. There's other things you've got to take care of. And that's when he started showing me the, 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 how unhealthy some of our churches were. As time went on, like I just told you, I was like, Pastor Pooley, I would love to see you take this role when I get back. And you know what? He called me back and says, yes, God made it clear. And I'm like, praise the Lord. I was so excited because I'm like, here's a man that has the mindset, the heart set, and the life set to be able to reach his own people. It was time. I was excited. I'm like, this is what it's about. Now, here's the thing. I told you my three priorities, but we had some underlying priorities, some small priorities that and we never really shared. And one of them was getting Kafula Futa and GCMS to the place of self-sustaining. That was something God laid on my heart a long time ago. I know it was something that was on this man's heart. I know it was something on the other man's heart by the name of John Sarah, but it just never was the time. And so that was one of my smaller priorities that I had talked with pastor. We got together and said, well, these are our, our major priorities, but these are some more we're going to be praying about. Well, I thought, man, praise God. God's doing it in steps, and this is going to happen. I can turn this over. I can come back. That was my plan. And like my wife said, we had a plan, right? We had a plan. Plans are good. They're not a bad thing. Plans are good. So we get back, like Miss Tammy said, we come back for, for our first furlough. And then Miss Tammy has, uh, I'm so used to saying Miss Tammy, only because that's how we say people over there, Miss Lauren and Miss Tammy. But, um, and then she had her strokes in December. And, uh, and again, like I said, that did, I think I said that the other night, that's not what deterred us. We were still looking at going direction of, uh, of going back, even with that. And I remember God gave me a verse, and I want to read this verse to you real quick. It's the last chapter of Deuteronomy. And it's about uh, the life of Moses. And it says here in Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 7, it says, And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He still had vision and he had strength. You see, he could have he kept going. He didn't die because he was weak. He didn't die because his health failed him. He died because it was time for his death, you see. And so when I read that, I thought, wow, that kind of connects to where we're at right now. And what I mean by that is, is we weren't going to allow Tammy's health to hold us back from doing what God wanted us to do. I mean, I had to look at it this way. Are we going to definitely go and then you're going to have to show us to stay? Or are we definitely going to stay and you're going to have to show us to go? That was difficult for me to try to figure that out. But we were always 100% committed. And you know that even the doctor said, look, you can still go if they have the right medications. And so we, our decision of coming back is not because of Tammy's health. Our decision of coming back is this. It's one thing, because it's the right time. It's God's time. It's what God told us to do. There's that uh, up there when we were singing, I think it says, give me faith to trust what you say. Wow, that hit me hard tonight. I was told a long time ago 
Brian, there might be a time in your walk with God where you're going to have to stand on an island alone with just him. And he's going to tell you to do something that nobody else is going to understand. And I, ha I hit that place. And I don't say it uh, in a negative sense towards anybody here. But I remember even going to those I know and saying, I think God is doing this. I think God is, is really wanting us to turn this ministry over. And they're like, it's not going to happen. I, I, it, and you know what? I had to finally, God gave me and said, look, look, I'm not responsible for the outcome. I'm just responsible for my obedience. And so God showed us little by little, step by step, 2020, through all the craziness, that it was time to come back. And I remember sitting with my pastor over here. And, uh, and I couldn't even say the words. I was sitting in his office, and, and I said, you know, I, I, I think I know what I'm supposed to do. I, what am I supposed to do? I think I said that. What am I, so, I, it was almost like I just wanted someone to tell me what I was supposed to do. And God used our pastor to say, Brian, I think you already know what you're supposed to do. And it was at that moment that I said it with my mouth for the first time out loud that God was calling us home. You know, doing what's right because it's the right thing to do is not the easiest thing to do in the world. Because here's the thing. I had to have a conversation with Pastor Poulet on the phone, and I had to say, look, I don't think God's just calling you to be the director of ministries. God is calling you to lead this ministry. I, I had the opportunity to talk to Pastor Alex and Pastor Poulet on the phone at the same time and share everything that I'm sharing with you I share with Pastor Poulet. And you know what he said? Let me pray about it. <laughs> I've got to pray about this. And you know what? Praise God. God was working in his life and his heart. He came back and said, no, I believe that this is what God is doing. So when I went back the last time, I had to sit down with the board and explain to them the exact same thing that I'm explaining to you. And they were all excited. It was the first time Bobby was there to help start the ministry. John continued the ministry. Kevin Petsky was the man who came and actually helped turn the executive board from American to nationals so that they were leading it. And now God is allowing us to be a part of something so special to actually turn this ministry over to the nationals. And when I told them that, they're all so excited about it. They just, they're looking forward to it. I know there's some fear there. Because there's always been a Mzungu in charge, the white guy. But you know what? They need to know that they can do this in Christ. They need to know that they can do this through the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. And before I came back, I, I only told, other than Alex, Alex and Crystal, they're just, they're a unique couple, right? They have the, they, they earn the right to know everything at the moment, well, almost at the moment's notice. And so I sat down with uh, Pule. And I sat down with Pastor Andrew Malenga, and I shared with them, and I said, guys, look, and this is one thing Pule kept saying. He'd say, Brian, um, one thing is, is Brian's sharing this with us, but he hasn't shared with us his vision for what he's going to be doing. He noticed that. He picked up on that. And I had to share with him that last week that we weren't coming back. It was the hardest thing I had to do. I sat there and I did not believe I was going to cry, but I wept in front of them because let me tell you, coming back is even harder than going there because that's where my heart is. That's where God broke my heart and gave me a heart for people that I didn't even know. So for him to say, Brian, you're, it's time, you're finished, you need to come back, that was the hardest thing. And that's why I was saying doing what's right is the hardest thing to do because I had to sit down with my wife and I had to look at her in her eye and say, "Hun, I know we just moved our family 8,000 miles, but now we've got to come back because God is telling me to. And I had to sit down with Pule and said, Pule, I love you. I love you guys, but God is calling us away. And, and we were all crying. We were all sitting there just tearing up and crying because it was difficult. But it was a cry of rejoicing at the same time because that which God laid on my heart, that's what he laid on my heart a long time ago. I get to see come to fruition. There are things that God laid on your heart probably 30 years ago that's happening right now. That's something to be excited about. That's something to be thankful for. But I also want to let you guys know, and it's 815, we'll be getting into the message soon. <laughs> <laughs> It's an all-nighter. Nobody's near any windows, right? You're going to fall out. But, uh, so, but here's the thing, and I'll close out the testimony with this, is that 
One thing God has laid on my heart is, is, you, is exactly what your pastor is telling you. He says that he wants us to continue to invest in Kafula Futa to be a shot in the arm for Pastor Pule and the organization. Praise God for that. And that tells you that we're not abandoning this ministry. There's no abandonment taking place. This is something that we really, I really feel like we can do more from this side of the lake than we can from that side because they know the word. They know the word better than most of us here, better than me. They know how to reach their own people. They don't need me there for that. But what we can do is be a support from this side for them over there. And so one thing we've talked about is um, even after I move back, I'm remaining on the GCMS executive board. You see, because why? The world's this big with technology. I can just get on a phone and be right there with them to help advise and direct and guide financially in many different ways. So I'm still going to be active. I'm still going to be involved. Prayerfully, I'm still going to be talking to churches and however it might work, churches that we're connected with, to have teams still go back over there. You know, Pastor Pule, GCMS, doesn't just need a shot of financial support. They need a shot of church support. We still need to send teams over there to encourage them. This is the time where they need the encouragement the most. Amen? So that's exactly why what God has laid on my heart to share with you all. I know it went a little bit longer than normal, and I'm sorry about that, but there's still so much to share, and trying to get it done in a short period of time is very difficult. But you know, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Like my wife said, we, there never was a day that we went wanting. We ask that you never forget us going over, and you didn't do that. You prayed for us. You financially supported us. You sent teams over to engage with us and the people you guys did exactly what the church was supposed to do. I mean, I've never seen nothing like it before. The way you rallied around us, behind us, to help us is something amazing. And I'm just prayerfully asking that we continue to do so. I have no doubt that eventually this church is going to send out another missionary. It's going to send out another pastor. We're going to plant some churches because that's what we're supposed to do. And we need to get behind whoever it is in order to do so. Because God has called us to the mission field to reach other places, even across the road, across the state, across the country, across the world. Amen? So thank you very much for everything you've done for us. We couldn't have done it without you. And man, we love you so much. You're my family. Amen? So thank you guys very much for everything. And now let's get into the Word of God. because that, and, and I'll make it short. I, I will. Uh, you know, here's the thing. Let me tell you. Titus even said, Dad, you preach longer than the Zambians do. See, <laughs> over there, there is no clock. You just go. You just go, you know. Amen. And that's okay. I understand where we're at. Amen, brother. Amen, Pastor Alex. Amen. All right. So that leads us into our message of tonight, you know. And, and we'll probably go things, uh, I'll go through things a little bit. Um, but it does lead us into the fact of the title tonight bookends of a crucified life, an uncommon faith. Because when I say these things, within a bookends, there's a bookends. And I want to share this real quick with you now, how important this verse right here is to me and my family. Most men proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. This is a very dear verse to me. And let me share with you why. Like I said, there's bookends within bookends. Um, it was... I think August of 2014, I was at Heathrow Airport in London, and just leaving from Zambia. I was there for a couple weeks, really, on a survey trip, whether we were supposed to go to Lusaka or whether we were supposed to go to Kafula Futa. And I was sitting in the airport on a 12-hour layover. 12 hours, it was fun, right? What are you going to do? And I remember sitting there, and I was asking God, God, where would you have us to go? And... Uh, would you rather have us go to Lusaka or would you rather us go to Kufula Futa? And let me just tell you, this is, this, it didn't hit me until I was talking to Pastor Pule, Pastor Alex, and Pastor Andrew about this verse. This is the exact same verse that God used in my life to give me confirmation we were supposed to go to Kufula Futa. And this is the exact verse that God is using in my life to bring us back to Blue Springs, Missouri. I was so overwhelmed by that. And it wasn't something uh, prideful or anything. I just remember 
When God gave me this, this is what he spoke to my heart. He said, Brian, when you go, don't worry about your name. Don't worry about your name. Just lift up my name. Just lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Just be faithful to me as I've been to you. He used this verse to take me there, and he's using this verse to bring us home. Isn't that amazing? That's the bookends of our ministry in Kafulafuta, in Zambia. And it was overwhelming when God showed me this. But when it comes to this, though, at the same time, one thing God showed me, and let me tell you, I have failed in this, just as you all have failed in this, but yet God's grace and mercy has kept me afloat and alive, is that in order to do what God wants you to do, you have to live a crucified life. You have to be willing to say no to the body, no to what you want, no to your desires, but you got to say yes to God. Amen? And so that's where we get to right now. Where are we at right now with the crucified life, with the life that God has given us? Real quickly, go to Revelation chapter 1, and we'll be in Revelation real quick, chapter 1 and verse uh, chapter 5. And I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 5, and then we'll be over in Revelation 3, 14, because when you read the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, the first chapter, Jesus Christ gives a description of himself, of who he is, and what he's like. He gives a whole list of who he is, right? And when you read the books to the churches, he takes a description of who he is or a character quality, and he applies it to that church specifically. In other words, who he is is who he becomes to that church. And we don't have the time to go through all of them. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, we'll stop there. So right here, he says, I am the faithful witness. Now jump over to chapter 3, in verse 14. It says, and unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, we talked about that last night, right? These things say at the amen, faithful and true witness. See, he had to tell, he doesn't say it to any other churches but Laodiceans. He says, I am the faithful and true witness. But it's interesting because he adds a word. He adds the word true. He doesn't say it over here in his first description, but he says it to the Laodiceans. And I think it's interesting because the word, that word witness, you know what it means? Martyr. It means to be a martyr. He says, I'm the faithful and true martyr. So if he's proclaiming himself to be the faithful and true martyr, then he's probably telling us, hey, behind the screen, you're not faithful and you're not a martyr. You haven't martyred your life. You haven't been the witness I've been asking you to be, you see? That's what he's telling the church. He's telling, I am the faithful, I am the true witness, I am the one who sacrificed my life for you. See, there's a lot of fake witnesses out there, but he says, I'm the true witness, amen? I think this is what he's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us that we have failed at times in being a faithful martyr for the name of Jesus Christ. The church of Laodiceans, many of them for false witnesses, and that goes to be true with us. You see, what a martyr means is someone who's willing to die because of their beliefs. Jesus Christ, well, he is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He was dying for what he believed in, and what he believed in is what he created. See, he created us to worship. He, he created us to praise him. He is worthy and he only him. So he says, because I created these people, they are worth dying for. And I will give my life and be a martyr because that's what a martyr is. Someone who is willing to die for what they believe. But he's telling the church, I don't think you're willing to die for what you say. You say it with your mouth, but do you believe it with your heart? You see, and God has given us another book to look at, believe it or not. And I believe the book, now you can go over to... Galatians, the book of Galatians, because it's interesting. We always teach, which is true, that the book of Galatians is a book about liberty, correct? But I really truly believe with all my heart the book of Galatians is also a book of crucifixion. It's a book of crucifixion. And I'll show you that through the scriptures, but it's, it's through this book of crucifixion. And how is that? Because you cannot have liberty without crucifixion. Something must die in order to be made free, right? And the book of Galatians is there to show us this. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Who gave himself 
for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present and evil world according to the will of God and our Father. You see, he gave himself for our sins that we might be delivered from this present and evil world. You know, every time you read the Bible, it doesn't matter what dispensation you're reading, it was a present and evil world. And it's not getting better. I don't care what anybody says. We're going down the tubes quickly. And God needs and he wants faithful witnesses because the time's getting short. But unfortunately, oftentimes we forget about the crucifixion that was made for you and me. So actually, in the, in the book of Galatians, there's four different crucifixions of the believer. And God showed me this a while back. The first one, it's the crucifixion of the cross. That, it's the cross itself in Galatians chapter 3. So in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, let me get back over there. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He's saying it's been evidently shown. We've proven it to you that Jesus Christ was crucified. And he says, who hath bewitched you? Who's twisted your mind? Who's given you lies to get you stopped believing this? See, there has to be a realization. We have to realize. I mean, I, th I think some of us might say, well, is that the right word? Well, I, I remember there were two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus with Jesus Christ, and they didn't even realize they were talking to Jesus Christ. They didn't realize that he was walking next to them until he enlightened them, until he opened their eyes. See, a lot of us, like we saw yesterday, need to put that eye salve on because we are blinded. And we need to realize on a daily basis of what Jesus Christ did for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. It says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Remember that. True peace is the absence of God's wrath. And we're justified by his blood for when we were enemies. Remember when our pastor preached on that just a few weeks ago. But I love this because it says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. But wait, there's much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I love that, much more, much more. There's always much more with God, you see? We're justified by his blood, we're saved, we're reconciled by Jesus' death, and we're saved by his life. See, these are the things we need to remember. We need to recognize this on a daily basis because there are those out there who are trying to get us off the path. See, it all comes back to the cross. To some, it's foolishness, but us, it's the power of God. We sang about that tonight. It's our peace. The cross is our joy. The cross is the only thing that we should be glorying in. That's it. Just the cross. We need to realize on a daily basis that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and me. It's the cross. It's the cross that made the difference in our life. But as we glory in talking about that, that leads us into our second. Look at Galatians chapter 6. I believe it's uh, verse 14. This was Paul's attitude that he had. He said, but, for God, but, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. See, this is a second crucifixion. First, you have to know what Jesus Christ did for you. And then you have to have an attitude in your life that I am dead to the world, and the world is dead for me. What Jesus Christ did on the cross was he freed you from death and he gave you eternal life. But what this does here, when you die to the world and the world dies to you, that frees you from covetousness. This world has a lot of beautiful things, but it's nothing that can ever replace the glory which is revealed in Jesus Christ. Amen? See, it's the cross that we're to glory in. It frees us from that covetousness. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and what? Covetousness, which is idolatry. See, here's the thing. The world wants to draw you in because if it can get you to worship it, it will take your eyes off the king. You will forget that he died on the cross for you and you will be brought in and sucked in by the things of this world. And one of my favorite quotes by Jim Elliott, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Amen? 
We have to crucify ourselves. We have to have the right attitude to die to the world and have the world die to us. The third one's found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. It says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of the lust." See, not only do you have to recognize on a daily basis that Jesus died for you, not only do you have to have the attitude in your life that the world is dead to you, has nothing to offer, and you have nothing to offer to this world, but yet at the same time, you have to make a decision on a daily basis because it's when you crucify the flesh, it takes away the desires and the wants of what your flesh wants, and only the cross can free you from that lust. Only the cross can free you from that lust because that old nature is going to come back and it's going to want something more that it used to taste in your past. It's going to want, it's going to want, but if you wake up on a daily basis and like it says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? That's how you overcome. I may have shared with you there was a drunkard who came to me and says, how did you overcome how did you stop drinking? Because he had heard my testimony. I said, I can just tell you. I gave my life to Christ. I dove into him. He's into me. I walk in the spirit, and it took it away. He walked away still wanting. He wanted something quick and now. And you know what? If he just gave Jesus a chance in his life, it is a quick and now. But he wanted a pill. He wanted a remedy of something of this world. He probably wanted something that would give him the ability to be able to continue to drink. Because, see, we enjoy our sin. He didn't like what I had to say. But it's the only thing I can give you. I stopped drinking. I stopped drugs. Because why? I walked in the Spirit. You have to make that daily decision. It says here in Romans 6, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. You know, when you read in the same passage of Romans 5 and Romans 6, it talks about two different reign. You can either let the sin reign in your life or you can let grace reign. And if you let sin in your life, you're going you're gonna to be a servant to unrighteousness. But if you allow grace, God's favor in your life to reign in your life, guess what? You're going to obey unto the righteousness that we talked about yesterday. Amen? The word right there, let, it's choice. You have to make a choice. You have to choose and make a decision on a daily basis whether you're going to say yes to the flesh or say yes to God's Spirit. And the fourth one here in Galatians 2.20, one of my favorites. Honestly, Bobby, it's hard for me to say this verse without singing it. I am crucified with Christ. Never the let you. I, that's how I learned the song. Learned the verse was through Bobby. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I... But Christ liveth in us. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it's a crucified life that you have to have. And when you have a crucified life, it becomes a lifestyle on a daily basis. And it's only the cross that can free you from the bondage and set you unto liberty. That's it. It's the cross. See, the cross is connected to all four of these. Because it takes a crucifixion in your life. John 8, 36 says this. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And you know, and that's why I love the King James Bible. And I'm just saying it, it's true. Because other versions take out the word make and they put the word set. See, if you're set free, that means you can get back in bondage again. Just because you set somebody free, they might do the same thing to go put back in bondage. But when you're made free, you're made free. There's no bondage forcibly in your life. Now, you may choose to go back in that bondage, but yet you're made free. You, you, are, you are now free to serve God as you ought to serve God. There's nothing else holding you back. Amen? Your flesh can't do it. The adversary can't do it. Nobody can do it. If the Son there shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So these are the four crucifixions that God showed me in my life, that you have to wake up on a daily basis and make a decision. You have to realize it. You have to have an attitude. You have to make a decision. And you, at the same time, you have to make a choice. Right? Amen? You have to have that choice. You have to have the attitude. Lord, I'm not connected to this covetousness anymore. But here's the thing. This book doesn't just show us about the crucifixions. It also shows us about our adversary. 
One thing that we always have to remember, it's not a what, it's a who. It's not a what that's going to get you to fall back into whatever it is. It's always a who. There's always a who behind the what. The adversary's desire, okay, the adversary's desire is this, is to always bring us back into a place of death, to bring us back into a place of covetousness, a place of lust, a place of bondage. And bondage will keep a person from being scripturally faithful, that in commonality that we've been talking about. That's what bondage is going to do. You can never be faithful. You can never be uncommon if you keep your life in bondage. So look at this. We'll look at the who real quick. Galatians chapter 1, verse 7. Talking about the gospel, it says, Which is not another, but there is some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. There are some people in your lives, in my life, that is trying to pervert the gospel. They're trying to have it to say something that it never said. They even take scripture and try to justify their perversion. Amen? That's what the Bible says. There are some that are coming in to do this. Look at um, chapter 2, verse 4. It says, And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. See, there were false brethren. Guess what? There's false Christians. Paul said, not all Israel is Israel. Well, I can tell you the same. Not all Christians are Christians. The adversary has his own people in each local New Testament church trying to fulfill his agenda. And you know what they try to do? They try to bring us back into bondage again. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Look at, look at um, chapter 3, verse 1. We've already read this. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth. Who is it that you've allowed in your life to twist your mind? Who are you listening to on the radio? Who is it in your life that you're allowing into your inner circle to twist your mind about the truth of the word of God? Look at chapter 5, verse 7. It says, For we through the Spirit... Or, uh, chapter 5, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 7. It says, Ye did run well... Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? It doesn't say what hindered you. It says who hindered you, who slowed you down. Have you ever seen somebody? I've seen it before. People come to church, they get on fire, they're being discipled, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, the opposite sex comes into their life, a woman or a man, and they start spending time with that person. The next thing you know, you don't see him again. I've seen it happen. Who did hinder you? You were running so fast. You were going straight and narrow on that path. Who hindered you? Who is it that did that? Well, what does Paul say about these people? Look at verse 12. He said, I would that ye even would cut off which troubleth you. Cut them off. Get them out of your life. Just get rid of them. Now, don't go and all of a sudden say, the preacher says, I got to kick you out. Boom, and you're gone, right? I'm not saying that. But for some of you, it might be something that has to happen right now now, right? For others, it might have to be a little more finesse. See, that's where it's going to depend upon the counseling of your pastor and other people who know the Lord and have invested their life in the Lord. You need that type of counsel because you have to get rid of them. You have to have them out of your life because the adversary is trying to hinder your walk and your growth in Jesus Christ. And here's what we need to get. We need to get to this place, church. Look how Paul's attitude in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. He says this. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, from this point, I'm taking a stand. I'm not going to allow any of these people to come in and trouble my life. Why? Because I bear the marks. I, I died with Christ 2,000 years ago. The marks that he bore, I bear now in my life. How can I show him shame by hindering and allowing these people to come in and twist my mind? See, we've got to get to the place where we are like him and do not allow anyone to trouble us. The churches of Galatia have been receiving the wrong counsel. They allowed people to come in and to lead them astray. Church, we need each other more than ever right now. We need men and women who know the word, who can help these young youth 
along the way. Maybe those who are struggling, maybe the new believers, because the adversary is trying to get them to hinder. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5 says, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. You know, the thought, if, if you are living a righteous life, your mind is going to be in the scriptures. Your mind is going to be thinking right. But it says here, the counsels of the wicked are deceit. They're always going to be trying to lead us astray one way or the other. And it's very subtle. Our adversary is very subtle in the way he handles things. But so what are we supposed to do? I can tell you what, I love the Bible because it's simplicity. Proverbs chapter 19, 27. This is what we're supposed to do. Cease, my son, to hear instruction that causeth error from the words of knowledge. Stop listening to them. Stop listening to that instruction. God has given us a word. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And guess what? Instruction in righteousness. To get into the word of God and allow it to take you down that path. Stop listening to those out there. Cease, my son, from the instruction that causes you to err from the words of knowledge. That means some of you might have to turn off the TV. You might have to turn off the video games. You might have to turn this off, this off. You might have to sever some things out of your life. Last night we talked about the things we have to unclog. Tonight it's more about are there people in our lives that we have to unclog. Paul bears the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ through his faith, through his faith walk. He has committed himself to a life of Christ-like faith, Galatians 2.20. He realized on a daily basis the death of Christ on the cross. He had an attitude towards the world and the world towards him. He made daily decisions to walk in the Spirit, even though we know he struggled in Romans chapter 7. He struggled just like we do, but yet he made a decision to walk daily in the Spirit. And he maintained a life of Christ-like faith. He encompassed his entire life as a crucifiable type of life. A crucified life. And you can put all four of these in one verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. It says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. I die daily. I, I, I die for myself. I die to this world. I, die, uh, I, my, my, I bear the marks of Jesus Christ. This is my life. I'm choosing to walk with Jesus today and every day. If you don't crucify the flesh, if you don't realize Jesus Christ on a daily basis died for you, if you don't crucify yourself to the world and the world to you, and you don't live that life that Christ has called you to live, then you know what? then there's, there's no way that you continue to walk in the, in, the, in the spirit with Jesus Christ in the way he would have you to do, and you will walk in the flesh, and we know that no glory or no flesh shall glory in his presence. No flesh shall glory in the presence of Jesus Christ. The only thing that we are to glory in is the cross. It all comes back to the cross. So it comes down to our bookends of a crucified life. Yesterday, our bookends was the Word of God. And you remember how when Josiah got in the Word of God, it built a heart of conviction, and it held up his uncommon integrity. Well, tonight's, um, these bookends here is the walk of God, that faith. And on the other end is a heart of a martyr. And what that does, it holds up a believer's uncommon faith. If you wake up daily and choose to walk the faith of Jesus Christ, that will become a bookend, that walk of God. It's not your walk, it's his walk. And what that will do is help you develop a heart of a martyr, a, 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 the heart of a witness. And what that will hold up in your life is uncommon faith. An uncommon faith. That's what's going to get you through each day we got to remember that Jesus Christ, he freed us from death. He freed us from covetousness. He freed us from lust. He freed us from bondage. And what does the Bible say that we ought to do back for him? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable that we give our life back to God after what he's done for us. Amen. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus Christ, he's our true faithful witness. And he was shown the church the Laodiceans. You're not as faithful as you think you are. 
But I think God has challenged us tonight. We have to really look deep within our own lives. Are we walking that uncommon faith? Are we walking the walk of God? And are we over here um, allowing the heart of a martyr, a heart of witness in our lives to keep us on that, that path of faith? It's only reasonable that we live a life of un un uncommon martyrdom for his glory and honor, honor. The liberty that we have in Christ can only be found in death. And we have to make that decision every day. It's going to take a realization. It's going to take an attitude. It's going to take a decision. It's going to take a daily lifestyle. And the only way it's going to happen is if you say, I die daily. Amen. Uncommon faith of Christ that leads to uncommon faithfulness. Jesus is the faithful and true witness. It's only reasonable that we reciprocate that back to him and be the faithful witness he's called us to do. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for tonight. I thank you so much for giving my wife Tammy the strength to get up here and to share with everybody her love for this church, her love for what you've done in her heart in Zambia, what you've done in my heart and Bobby's heart and so many other people that are sitting in this room. And Lord, any time you ask us to do something, we have to really check our lives. We have to look at where we are. Are we going to say yes to you? Or are we going to say yes to our own life? Are we going to crucify our flesh? Are we going to crucify this world? Or are we going to give in and say yes, Lord? Lord, those words that we just were asking, give us the faith so that we can trust your words, Lord God. And I don't know where everybody's at tonight. But I ask and pray that you would move in and through our church body. Thank you for their faithfulness to us while we've been in Zambia. Thank you for the faithfulness that they have right here to this church body. Now, Lord God, do an amazing work. Help us to all examine ourselves. And really look at our lives. Lord, is there anybody that we really have to move out so that you can move in? We love you and praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I know it's late. needs to know Jesus. Has.